Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Harvest Church of God. I am so happy to see everyone this Sunday. I missed you last week. Did you miss me? Yeah. No. <laughs> it, it, I, my presence here doesn't matter. It's, it's the Lord. We come to worship the Lord. Amen? Who, well, then that leads me to this. Who's ready to worship the Lord this morning? Oh, yeah. There we go. There we go. Would you mind please standing with me? And please greet your neighbor to your left and your right with a wave, a hello. Welcome them here in the house of the Lord this morning. And please grab your Bibles and open up to Luke chapter 6. I want to read verse 31 with you this morning. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. It's a verse we all know. We've heard it. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. When you get there, say amen. 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 Luke reads, Do to others as you would have them do to you. It's very simple. And I was talking to Jen this morning on our long car ride here this morning. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much in the world, and especially in the political realm, in, in our social media realm, there is so much hatred. So many people bickering that I would say, uh, can you just act like adults? But it's actually the adults. It's not kids. Part of my reading this morning was a part, uh, was part uh, of taming your tongue. And the tongue, like a huge ship, even though the ship is huge, the little rudder is very small, and it steers the whole vessel. We ourselves as adults, as Christians, talking about doing to others as you would have them do to you, how many times do you think people are actually thinking about that when they speak, when they present themselves to the world? Because we are called to be the light of the world, but how many of us is allowing that light to steer us? when our tongues tend to control us. So church, I ask and I challenge you this morning, and I challenge you every day when you wake up, prepare your hearts, prepare your minds, and prepare your tongue to treat others as you would have them treat you. I love how the message translates this. The Message Bible reads this particular passage as, here's a simple rule of thumb. For behavior, ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. With that, let us pray. Father, I am so grateful for who you are. The chances we have, the blessings you pour out on us each and every day. It is your love that should steer us, that should drive us in this world. It's how we interact, how we treat one another that shows that we are your children. If we call each other names, if we bicker amongst the Christians, and if we bicker amongst this world, are we truly acting as your children? Father, continue to pour out your spirit upon us. Continue to guide us, help strengthen us, help to teach us to control our tongue and to treat everyone in the love you would have for them. Not in the love we would have for them, but your love. Because every Christian can say, if God is for us, who can be against us? But what if Christians bicker among other Christians, Father? We have to show your love to this world. That's the only way healing will begin. Father, I've asked your blessings upon Pastor Darren as he leads us into your presence this morning. Father, let us hold nothing back in worship. Let us hold nothing back. Father, anoint him as he delivers your word this morning. Allow your word this morning to give us strength, to give us courage to carry your love into the world. Father, I ask all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. How many know our God is great? Come on, I, I wanna, let's give him praise because he is great. Amen. We glorify your name, Lord. We worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How great, how great our God is. Hallelujah. We just glorify you, Lord. The splendor of the King is clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. From age to age he stands, oh yes, and time is in his hands. Beginning at the end, well he's beginning at the end. God in three and one. He's Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, oh, the Lion and the Lamb. And how great is our God. Oh, sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how the name. He's the name of all. Oh, we worship your name. You are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. Oh, how great, how great is our God. see how great, how great is our God. Oh, how great, how great is our God. Oh, sing with me. Oh, Lord, you are great. And all the see. How great we just love you Lord you're worthy worthy of all praise how great he is hallelujah one day we're gonna rise to see him face to face what a beautiful day that's gonna be hallelujah There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail 
There's an anchor for my soul. Oh, I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory, oh, is won. For he is risen from the dead, and I will rise, oh, when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain, I will rise on eagle's wings before my God fall on. There's a day that's drawing near When His darkness breaks to light And the shadows disappear Oh, and my faith, oh yes, it will be my eyes For Jesus has overcome Oh, and the grave Victory is won, for he is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow. That is going to be a great day when we rise to see him. That blessed, blessed Savior, Jesus. Hallelujah. Is he your king? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Hallelujah. Glory to your name. I'm so glad that I'm forgiven. All because of what he did for us. He gave it all. Hallelujah. I'm 
forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amazing, amazing, amazing is your love for us. I'm so glad that it will never end. His love is always there. Doesn't matter what's happening, what you're going through. That's what you can stand on is his love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is amazing love, is it not, church, Amen. that we can be forgiven. Amen? Amen? Amen. You may be seated.
We've got a couple announcements before we get to announcements. Uh, those who are watching at home and those that are here in person, please go ahead and start prepping your communion. Uh, that way, when Pastor comes up here and do communion, we'll, we'll be prepared. Amen. Those that are at home, please, uh, Pastor's going to be doing communion in a little bit, so get whatever you have at home prepared and ready. And then uh, right now, I start asking you to prepare your hearts for communion. Amen. 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 Um, I got Jarrett putting up on the, the screen, uh, the church website. We all know how to get to the church website, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, who doesn't raise your hand? Who doesn't know how to get to the church website? Okay. I will come and help you later on, but typically you can go to harvestcog.org and that'll bring up to the main, the main site. But what I have here, you, it's. You, it's a click right off the main web page. It is our Under God Reviving One Nation. It's our 14 days of prayer and fasting, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to have sign-ups for it, and what we're asking is everybody go to the website and sign up. Jared, can you see the screen at all? Can you go over and click onto the Start button? So you just click Start. You could type in your name. You could scroll down a little bit. There's five questions. It should... Jared, why don't you sign up? <laughs> or you can sign me up. Go ahead, put in, put in Phil. All right, click OK. Uh, type in my email address, philwford at yahoo, if anybody needed to know. We're going to do this because I want everybody to know how to do it, yahoo.com. Click OK. All right, what would be a good time for Pastor Phil? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see, bright and early. Let's go in the afternoon. Uh, let's go 3 to 4, J. Click on, go down, 3 to 4, PM. Uh, two, yeah. more. Yeah. two more. Two more down, Jarrett, two more down. 3 to 4, 3 to 4. Right there. Okay, and then you could scroll all the way down. Sorry. You can pick more than one, Pastor tells me. Okay, and then click on, do you want to uh, commit to fasting the meal that corresponds to the one of the time slots you've chosen? Yes. Okay, scroll down. Okay, this is valid for the, uh, we're going to go scroll down. Uh, we're going to pick uh, four to five. Q, go down a couple more. And those who are watching at home, we're just going through the website to secure. Keep going down. Keep going. Right there. Right there. All right. And then scroll down some more. Click on submit. All right. There you go. Uh, it's simple. Just putting in your name, your email address, clicking on the times, committing to fasting during that meal that corresponds to your time. You can click more than one time. Uh, Pastor just told me. I figured that's what we could, but I didn't know if we could actually click it. So that way, if you want to be part of that time to, pr to pray and fast, you, you're more than welcome to click multiple times. Okay? Uh, so that is that is our 14 days of prayer and fasting. And I'm asking everyone here and those who are at home, uh, sign up. Sign up for all the times that you, you feel that you, God is leading you to pray and fast for, okay? Church, let's get together and let's pray. I mean, it's, it's very simple as saying, let's pray, church. What, what, what is one of the things that we should be doing as a church? Coming together and praying for one another. This is a big calling because we are praying for our nation. Amen? Because yeah. Pastor Phil gets up here and occasionally he goes, I, church, I need you to pray. He tends to go, I need you to pray for the children. I need you to pray for the students. And I'm going to ask you to pray for the students and the teachers. Pray for my lovely wife who's going insane for Anne Arundel County uh, and all the things that the teachers are now being told what they need to do and things changing every week as the governor speaks, as the county executives speak, things are changing. It's a world of change right now for our students and for our teachers. Uh, and that's just one area of our uh, of what our government is doing uh, for us. And so I'm asking not only to pray for them, but pray for our nation. Amen? 
I mean, this it's very simple. It's a call to prayer. 14 days. Who can pray for 14 days? It's simple. We've done 21. We've done 24. We've done 30. We've done 40 days of prayer. This is 14 days. Amen? We can pray. Uh, also, we come together on Wednesday nights. Wednesdays, harvest together. It's great to see all the people that do come out, but I want to encourage those who haven't been out yet, come join us on Zoom on Wednesday night at 7. Uh, we're doing our Bible study. Uh, for those who need the study guides, they're out there on the welcome table out there for you. Please pick those up as you leave church today. Don't forget them. I know Pastor will email one out on Wednesday. If you're not part of Pastor's email chain, please get with him after service. That way he can put you on an email chain for Wednesday's Harvest Together. Who's going to be there on Harvest Together this Wednesday? Okay. Those who didn't raise your hand, I want to encourage you and invite you out Wednesday night. This is your formal invitation. Please come on out and join us. God can change your world in just one little message. Amen? Amen. And then lastly is the food pantry. That's coming up this Saturday, the 19th. What time does it typically start? 9 a.m., yes, 9 a.m. So I want to ask all those who are willing to help and support the food pantry, this great ministry to our community, come on out a little bit before 9, help us get prepared, and that way we can service our community. Amen? Amen. Pastor? Amen. I wanted to uh, just piggyback on what Pastor Phil is saying there about our 14 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, what had come to me is to make sure that we cover every hour from 6 to 6. And in that, that time period from 6 to 10, 10 to 2, and 2 to 6 are meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And just to, when you if you're doing it at 7 o'clock, you know it's breakfast. If you're doing it at 1 o'clock, you know it's lunch. If you're doing it at 4 o'clock, you know it's supper uh, for fasting. But I'm really wanting to make sure we're not just doing this to do it. We're doing this exactly what I have up there. Under God, we're reviving one nation back together. Unity and revival. That's what we need to be praying about. That's what we need God to do. And in order for that to happen, we've got to get serious. And fasting and praying is serious. It is. It isn't just saying, well, I'm skipping a meal. No. You're taking the time and the hunger that you get and all of that and giving it to God. And saying, Lord, I'm consecrating myself for that time, that prayer, for you. Nothing else but for you. To know what you're going to do for us in our nation. And we definitely need a touch in our nation. Amen. Well, it is offering time in the house of God. I'm so glad he gives us this chance. We are to be able to give. I know some of you look at me and go, why are you so excited about giving? I'm excited that he's given me what I have to be able to give. <laughs> you know? So I want to make sure. And I'm excited about him. A.W. Tozer, very famous uh, evangelist back in the day, once said this. He said, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan, our, plan only the things we can do by ourselves. See, God wants to be involved in every area of your life. If we could just live our lives with him as the priority, then all of our plans would never be without him. In fact, we wouldn't even try to live our lives without knowing what he wants first. See, if we do this, then whatever the circumstance we're in, we know that God has it there for a reason. Even if we don't understand it. So we just have to trust in him to take care of everything. So as we give today, I want to make sure that our hearts are a heart of trust, trusting God that he will take care of our needs, that he will take care of everything. Father, I just want to thank you. 
Well, I thank you, Lord, for the time that we have just in your presence. Lord, and it's not just right here at church, but it's every single day, every moment of the day, we can be in your presence. So, Lord, I'm asking now that you would touch us and help us to have a heart full of trust. That we look to you, whatever we are doing. That before we do it, we look to you and say, Lord, is it pleasing? Is it what you want? So that we know whatever situation is happening, you're the one in control. You're the one. And Lord, that whatever it is, even though we don't understand it, you, you do. You understand it all, Lord. So as we give today, we want to give out of love and obedience and trust that you'll handle it all. We thank you for your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and give unto the Lord. Say that name with me, Jesus, Jesus, the powerful, the beautiful, the wonderful name of Jesus, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you would go ahead and prepare yourself for communion. read a second set of scripture that is put after but needs to be thought of before in partaking in communion. It says, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. What Christ did for us cannot be repaid. We can't earn it. He did it freely. Out of love and his grace, he gave himself for us, wholly for us. The Lord Jesus, on the night he, betray, he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. Oh, Lord, I just want to thank you. Thank you for giving it all for us. For giving it all for me, Lord. For making a way that I could be brought back into your, your arms. Lord, I thank you for taking every bit of sin and throwing it away. Covering it, getting rid of it. So that I could be in your sight and in your name Sinless and blameless and Lord, without blot or blemish. Because I'm in you, Lord. You, Jesus, are our lamb. The sacrificial lamb that was given for the sins of the world. So we just glorify you, Lord. We don't do this lightly or irreverently, Lord. But we do this with the utmost awe. And wonder of who you are. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just place in us and touch us to know. To truly know. To think, bring us back to the date when it happened. Like we were just standing right there. That we would truly know what you did for us. Make our spirit witness with yours, Holy Spirit. In knowing it all and how we have to live. Lord, and we give it all to you, our whole lives. And we thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, you're wonderful, Lord, you're wonderful, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise, we praise, we praise your name. Hallelujah. He's great. He's wonderful. He's matchless. He's magnificent. He's awesome, and he's our God. We are his. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are yours, Lord. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. you turn with me to Romans the third chapter and I'm gonna just have you stay seated I have quite a bit of verses to read been kind of going through Romans here giving us an understanding of what Paul is doing and saying in his writings here I'm gonna be starting at the first verse Romans 3 says, what advantage then is there being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true, and every human being a liar. And as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail you when you judge. But if our right, unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. And he said here, certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Some might argue, if my falsehood advances God's truthfulness, and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderous claim, that we say, let us do evil, that good may result? Their condemnation is just. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. 
For we all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. And as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They, have all, they all have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery marks their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. For there is no fear of God before their eyes. Sounds familiar. Now we know what, what, that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Because God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Through the shedding of blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because of his forbearance he had left the sins committed before and unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is the boasting? It is excluded. Because of the law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God only of the Jews? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Father, I just want to thank you. I thank you, Lord, because you've given us the law and the commands that we have to live by. But in order to live by them truly, we have to have faith in you. We have to have faith in Christ as our Savior. We have to be living for Him. That's the only way that that law can truly be applied and we can live it truthfully. So, Lord, I'm asking you now just to touch us as we hear your word. Help us, Lord, to understand and to, to take what we're, what we're hearing and what we're learning and walk in it, live it. Lord, help us to show it to the world. And we love you for your grace, your love, for your mercy, for just all that you have been done for us. And we ask this in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Today I'm going to be speaking about everyone means everyone. We all need Jesus. Now today I'm going to do something maybe a little bit different. I'm going to be doing a little more discipling and a little more teaching today. See, one of the great tragedies that I see in culture is that we've lost the ability to talk to one another reasonably. There's some reasons that we can see that this has come about. First is a deficiency within our education system. We really don't teach philosophy or history together. And I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But the second is the advent of social media. Now, I'm not saying there's, it's all wrong or anything like that. We use it here at the church to help, to help breach the community and to help us to stay informed. But we've limited our debate and our skills to 280 characters. And if you're not familiar with that, that's by the means of the amount of characters you can have on Twitter at, to make a point. It used to only be 140, and they changed it to 280. And even though they did double it's still a place for briefer thoughts. With only 1% of tweets hitting that 280 character. 
Only 12% even gets to the 140 characters. That's not very much. You can barely say anything in 140 characters. We have become a people of extremely short attention spans. We're easily moved by the emotion of every clickbait story. We even, even see these extremely slanted TV news broadcasts and we get emotionally involved in it without really even knowing about it. Much of our society has completely lost the ability to even have a rational conversation. Instead, we hide behind these large walls and all we do is lob single sentences over at people. A little thought at them. See if we can get them moving. See if we can get some rile out of them. Instead of sitting down and having an actual conversation. To me, that's part of the reason we're seeing a lot of the chaos in our nation today. We've forgotten how to think for ourselves. We've forgotten how to communicate the thoughts in, in, in a way that's compelling and honest and kind. The failure to teach history and learn its lessons is one of those problems. Why? Right now, there's a group in the country that's trying to rewrite history to fit their narrative. Or they're trying to get rid of history altogether because they do not like the truth. But see, education is not just about stuffing our minds and our heads full of facts. Real education is about giving you some knowledge base for you to know how to think for yourself. There was a challenge, a, a, a slogan a number of years ago that came out and said, challenge everything. A lot of pastors didn't like this. They, were, they, they thought it would encourage people to doubt the authentic, authenticity of their faith. I actually think we need to encourage everyone to question your faith. Now, you need to understand what I mean by that. I mean, ask some hard questions. In fact, in many of the parts of the Bible, God encourages us to honest and ask honest questions. We need to understand that those who have paved the way in studying and paved the way through studying the Bible and giving explanations through God-given wisdom, they're not to be thrown out. That's not what I'm saying. We need to take what they have given us, learn, and read it, and learn about it, and help it, hopefully help us to dive deeper into the meanings of what the Bible is telling us. Now, you may all kind of wonder where I'm going with this, but we don't want to abandon those things, which I've seen in the nation today, where they're abandoning, abandoning history and abandoning things. And if I remember, Ronald Reagan was the one that said... If we don't learn about history, we will repeat history. A few weeks ago, we lost one of the greatest Christian apologists, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. Now, you understand that I'm not talking, when I say a Christian apologist, I'm not talking about somebody who says they're sorry for Christianity. Okay? I'm not going there. I'm not. Not ashamed of the gospel. The Christian apologist is not uh, is one that is a person that's able to give an answer for hard questions that people pose against Christianity or in Christianity. Both from a scriptural perspective and from a philosophical perspective. See, his whole ministry was answering tough questions. And it was tough questions about his faith. Now, I hope that all of us would strive to be good apologists of our faith. We need to know why we believe what we believe, right? Somebody comes up to you and asks you, why do you believe this? You don't want to go, because my pastor told me to. I'm glad you think of me in that way. But that's not what you need. to. You need to be able to answer the word for the word that's in here. We need to be able to answer the tough questions for people. When we go to, these, to answer these questions, we need to do it, though, 
in an actual conversation. Now, I know that we like to post things, and I do it every once in a while. I'll post a thing to, for encouragement, and, and a lot of times my things are really long, and I really don't even know if people read all the way through it because of them so used to such a small amount. They'll read a few lines and go, okay, I'm done. But we need to make sure that we can actually have a true conversation. Sit down with people and tell them what God's done for you. Tell them about the word and how it's changed your life. That's what we need to be able to do. In fact, I think if Jesus was here today, he may have a social media page. I don't know. He may be progressive in that aspect. But I'll tell you this. He would want to talk about the most important conversations and questions. He'd want to do that one-on-one. -on -one. He'd want to do it face-to-face -face or at least with a group face-to-face. One of the ways that we can practice apologetics is through making a statement and then allowing other people to challenge it. Let them bring up statements. Let them question what we're talking about. I want you to remember that in the next couple of weeks as we keep going through Romans and looking how Paul defended the Christian faith in Romans. Paul is being a Christian apologist here. He's making a statement. Then he's actually answering the logical questions that would come up from these. You know, I told you before, last week and the week before, that he's acting like a lawyer. Well, a lawyer, that's what he does. He considers something to be a fact, and he dissects that, you know, quote, unquote, that fact. He either proves it or disproves it. That's what he does, depending on what side he's on. Well, that's what Paul is doing in the first part of Romans. And in chapter 3, here he is answering some of those common objections that people have with the gospel of grace. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here with this, but I kind of want to give you a feeling of what we need to be able to answer and how we need to be able to learn from the Word. This is not just about filling our head with knowledge. We need this to help us read our Bible for ourselves and understand what Paul is trying to tell us, what the different writers are trying to tell us, what God is trying to tell us. If we look at verses 1, 3, 7, and 9, we see a series of statements that Paul is saying here. And he frames the defense of Christianity in these. It's important to see how he actually does this. See, he knows his audience. He knows that most of them are converted Hebrews that are steeped in the Torah and they're steeped in the Mosaic Law. But he also has a lot of Greeks in his church. And he understands that they understand philosophy. They think of the Socratic way of thinking and how to argue their faith. So Paul does that here. You know, Socrates was a Greek philosopher considered actually the father of philosophy which is the pursuit of truth. And the reason I'm saying, I'm not talking about philosophy and thinking I'm just going to go off into some. No, it's the pursuit of truth. And we need to know the truth, right? And the truth is the word. So he uses this Socratic method in how he does his apologetics. There's a truth statement and then people ask questions. And then they, they try to, he defends the statement, and then they try to go on and see whether they agree or disagree, and then they keep asking questions until sooner or later there is an agreement reached about the truth claim, whether it's true or whether it's false. That's the basics of how the Socratic method is done, and that's what Paul uses here. I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis of what we can see because I don't want to see guys glazed over. I don't want to see people falling asleep. I want us to be able, this is not just a classroom. I want us to be able to see what Paul's trying to tell us here. The first question in verse 1 is, is there advantage to being a Jew? And he said, yes, but it's only in that their nation was used to bring the word of God to us. What if these chosen Jews didn't have faith? They are still subject to the same requirements of salvation that everybody else is. What if me sinning makes God look more holy? Well, that's where Paul gets into a little mocking thing, and he's just like, please. Have you ever run into somebody like that? They'll give you an, uh, ask you a question, and you're like, come on. Well, that's what he's trying to say. This is a ridiculous claim. 
let us do evil that good may result. Because the darkness of evil makes God's light look more brighter. Come on. That's a dumb argument for somebody to come up and try to say. You know, people do that. When they're losing an argument, they'll instantly try to shift the thing and, and say, well, I ain't got this. Let me try something else. And they'll try to point in something that you've done and see if they can change the subject. But that's what, this, what Paul is trying to do here. In verse 9, he says, does that mean Christians are better than Jews? No. And here's the key. All are alike and all are under sin's curse. Everyone means everyone. All means all. All of us. Every single human who's ever lived is under the sin, sin's curse. Here Paul quotes from the Old Testament, and, and mostly in Psalms, to prove this. He says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. And he sets all of this up so that he can use against the arguments that you see in verse 19 and 20. Now when we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. That's meaning that everybody's under the law. That everyone is under the, the curse of sin. Every person. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. That's saying that I'm not going to be, I can't do it by my works. Okay? My righteousness is because of him. Because my righteousness is filthy rags. And no matter how much I try to do just by saying I'm covered, doing the law, I'm, I'm following the law, if my heart's not right with Christ, it doesn't matter. The law doesn't make us righteous. It only shows us right and wrong. But there's something that we need to know here. Who's under the law? Is it just the Jews? No, it's everybody. We all are. Every person. That means everybody outside of Christ is doomed for the same reason, because they're under the law. All 613 Old Testament laws all come to the same point. And this is the way they look at it. This is the laws from the people that are looking at laws only for the law's sake. Do what God says perfectly or you spend eternity in hell. One infraction, one simple act of rebellion and guess what? You're done. The other thing they see is that nobody can earn God's favor through the law. Because it's impossible for the imperfect to be perfect. Now I know men... You may think in your head, wait a minute, I'm perfect. Now, we have at least one flaw, I would say, or two or maybe a few others, if you ask some of the ladies around here. We all have flaws. We're not perfect, none of us. You know, if I shattered a mirror and then used super glue to put it back together, no matter how exacting I was in the repair, you'll always see the brokenness. You ever seen that before? No matter what you try to do, it's like, oh, man, that line is still... Now my whole face is weird because I'm trying to go back and forth between the line. See, that's what sin does to our lives. Once committed, there's only brokenness. And, and us depending on our own goodness to win God's favor by trying to just obey the law... It's like trying to make that broken mirror perfect again. So after dealing with a few objections, Paul now brings the gospel. He spent the last part of that second chapter and the first part of the third proving there is no way to God on your own effort. And that's when he brings it home. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. To which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes from God. Comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Because he paid the price with his blood. He paid the final sacrifice. He did this to demonstrate his justice. 
knowing that we are justified through Christ. You know, righteousness cannot be found in the law. That's what I've been trying to say throughout this. No matter how many people say in this world, I'm a good person. I can do this. I, I, I do things right. I don't treat people bad. I have to go to heaven. I'm only made righteous through Christ. That's it. Virtually every other religion on earth, and if you'll study it, you'll see, has personal performance as its criteria to make a person pleasing to whatever the deity they have that they're worshiping. Romans, they had a huge selection of gods. Whew. In fact, a lot of them matched the Greek gods. They all had to, they believed that if they had a proper sacrifice, if they did it the right way, if they, at the right time, at the, at the, at the right place, the right God, then it was right. Then everything would be fine. If you gave enough to the temple that you worshipped at, or if you, you had a good ethical conduct with others, and you know, if you messed up, there was a sacrifice or a payment that was given to forgive your sins. This is a man-made religion. That's why Paul emphasized, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You can't get there through religious practice of do's and don'ts. See, religion says do. Jesus says done. He says done. We're freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Now, you look at that word freely, and you may ask, so I don't have to do anything? Yes, you do. You have to believe. It's always been about belief. From Genesis 3 to now, it's always been about faith and believing that God's word is true. See, God made it simple, very simple. It's humanity that's messed it up. We keep adding to what God has already ordained. You know, if you look at the words in John, the third chapter, Jesus utters some famous words. In John 16, John 3, 16 and 17. We know that. But he prefaces it with an example from Israel's history. I want to show you something. And it may be something that many people miss. That they're not really looking at. Way back there in the Old Testament. Numbers 21. Israel wandering through the desert. Supernaturally being fed with the bread from heaven called manna. Some of them begin to complain about it. God's giving them free food, and they're like, please, I wanted it this way. So what does God do? He sends serpents, and they start to bite them and die. So God tells Moses to make a serpent of bronze, hoist it up on a pole, and whoever looks at it would be healed and saved. Now, here's the point that many people miss. From my research and looking at it and understanding, in order to be able to even hold that big bronze serpent, there had to be a cross beam. So it looked like a cross. So when Jesus said this, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. See, it wasn't the bronze serpent that saved them. It was looking at that cross. Whatever is going to be done, they were looking at it because they could see what was going to happen years and years and years when Christ came to be put on that cross for us. The work that Christ did on the cross, it's always been the answer for us. That's why Paul ends with that summary statement. Where then is boasting? It's excluded. On what principle? On that observing the law? No. But on that of faith. This is telling us that it's only faith and belief in Christ. Not something that we do on our own. That saves us. 
one of the things that people say, which is many times the most telling, that really, really don't have an idea about what Christian faith really means, is this. I don't know if you've ever had anybody say this to you. You think you're better than I am because you go to church. No, a billion and a billion and a billion times, no. I go to church because I know I'm the worst person on the earth. I have no other hope except Christ Jesus. On Christ, the solid rock, I will stand. Because everybody else is singing sand. If you have any hope, any other hope that's not in Jesus, you don't have hope at all. Because all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And that means there is no other way to heaven except through the redemptive work of Christ. What he did on that cross. Everyone means everyone. We all need Jesus. Everyone must come to Christ if they want to go to heaven. Everyone must come to Christ if they want eternal life. Everyone has to go through Christ. He's the only way. Would you stand with me, please? When I say everyone means everyone, that's even those ones that you see on the news or on videos that you can watch on different things, those ones who are cursing out people, those ones who think they have the way and are trying to destroy this nation they all need Christ we have to look at them through those eyes I know it's easy to look at them at, in a way that you go I'll oh, just get rid of all of them yeah, I'm sorry but you can I'm being straight with you I sometimes see it and I go I don't know what I'd do if you were right in my face like that I may lose it. <laughs> but I pray that I could look through the eyes of Christ at them and say, Jesus loves you. This I know. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. All the little ones to him belong. They're weak, but he's strong. He's strong. See, those people are in their weakness right now. And they need him. They need his strength. They need his love, his grace, his mercy. We need to have that heart. And that's what I'm praying for this 14 days of prayer and fasting. That one, our hearts will become so in tune with the Lord that we'll look at every person out there and we'll look at them through the eyes of Christ and pray for them. Try to reach them. Try to touch them with God. That we will be ready and we will be there when we need to, when they come up and say something to us about why do you believe that and what do you do? And you can actually come back and give them a truthful answer in love, in kindness. You can give that to them. Let God speak to them. Because you all know that the only, the, the only peace we're going to have is through Christ, right? And so we can try our best to make it a peaceful situation. But it's Christ that will make and give the peace. So if we promote him, if we put him out there, his word, then he'll do the work. 
No matter how much we want to, (laughs) he'll do the work. Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you. This world needs you. We all need Jesus. More than anything, more than anything, we need Jesus. He is the answer to it all. He's the answer to the conflict, to the chaos, to the hatred, or to the racism, to everything. He is the answer. So Lord, prepare our hearts. Not even waiting until the the 14 days when we're going to consecrate ourselves to you. But now prepare us so that we're ready. That that we're not put on in surprise because we know that there's going to be an attack. When when we concentrate ourselves for God, we know Satan's not going to like it. He's going to do whatever he can to stop it. He wants this world in chaos. He wants this world to die. But Lord, we look to you. We have faith in you. We have trust in your promises. We look to you, Lord. So touch us. Help us to understand every single day we need the Lord more than anything. Help us to share that with the world. Lord, give us a love. Give us a a desire. Give us a passion, a fire, a revival in this nation to reach the lost, to touch and help the hurting. It can only be done through you, Lord can only be done through you. I give you praise for you are my righteousness. I worship you almighty There is none like you. Oh, I worship you. I worship you. Oh, Prince of Peace. That is what I long to do. And I give you. For you are, you're my righteousness, oh, and I worship you, almighty God, for there is none like There's none like you. There's none like you. There's none like you. You're the only answer. You're the answer for our souls. It's you, Jesus. It's you, Jesus. It's you, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Mm. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Let our hearts be changed. Mm. Let our hearts be changed. 
Hallelujah. Mm, hallelujah. Mm. Another must. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, he's wonderful, 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 wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, let us be your people in everything that we do. Let us keep our trust. Let us keep our faith. Let us keep our holding on to you, Lord. In all of these times of troubles, we need to hold on to you. Hold on to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's wonderful. He's marvelous. He's gracious. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your touch, your presence, your word, Lord. Thank you for all that you are in our lives. And Lord, let us make sure that we don't just leave here the same, that we walk out these doors knowing that everyone needs you. We need you every single day. So help us as we wake up in the morning, as we go to bed at night, that our lives are for you and that we share your precious love with this world. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you for this. Let the words of our mouth, let the meditations of our heart, Lord. Lord, let them be acceptable in your sight. Not this world's sight, but your sight. Because you are our strength and you are our redeemer. And we ask this in your beautiful, precious name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I hope you all have a great and blessed week. If you can, see us on Wednesday. Be with us on Wednesday as we're sharing in the Word. If you can come out on Saturday to help us touch the community and share the love to the community. If not, I'll see you again on Sunday. But hopefully during this week, you can share the love of Christ with someone. Amen. Allow God to work through you. Even if you can't say words, you can still share his love by your actions. So let's share him. Amen. Have a great and blessed week.